God will get you for that one. <laughs> Maud is owned by Shout Factory. God will get you for that, Walter, is produced for entertainment purposes only. Sponsored in part by Findlay's Friendly Appliances. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of God will get you for that, Walter. Or, uh, in or this he, case, he might get Florida. Might get Florida today. this time. Yes. Hello and welcome. My name is Tom Cat, and I am joined by the fabulous, the delicious, the decadent Miss Tony Homer. That is I. <laughs> And yes, welcome. This is God Will Get You Without Walter, a podcast where we discuss the 1970s hit sitcom, Maud. Is that what we do? That is what we do. <laughs> Are you sure? Positive. Okay. <laughs> Just about. Almost. <laughs> Amongst other things. <laughs> Amongst other things, <laughs> indeed. We're not veering way off course. Um, and this is episode 32, mm. and we're discussing season two, episode eight, The Double Standard. The double Standard, uh, yes. it, was, it was written by Bob Grossman. Norman Lear was the executive producer, and Bob Weisskopf was the story editor. Mm-hmm. Um, the original air date was October 30th, 1973, mm-hmm. um, and this was one of the second times I did Maud Live. Right, I, right. I did a Maud Live Mother's Day special that was The Double Standard in another episode that we're going to get to within another couple of weeks. And that, that's on your, still available It is still to available to view on my YouTube channel. Mm-hmm. It is still available on my YouTube channel. And I think also we're potentially coming up on the, um, we're coming up on the one year anniversary of, we can't, no, we passed the one year anniversary of the first time I did Mod Live. Uh, but in, I think, February, or what, no, when is Mother's Day? Mother's Day's in May. May. So in May will be the one year anniversary of the Mother's Day go. special that I produced. There you go. Um, but yes. So without further ado, let's discuss the double standard. The double standard. Um, and it opened with Maud tasting, tasting some stew. Of, tasting a stew that Florida was making, which was butt kicking. She said, "Oh, with this stew, you really kick my butt." Yes. So. Yes. Um, <laughs> I have a so in, it's amazing in the first like five uh, minutes there's something that I really want to address mm-hmm. um, so mm-hmm. years ago the ballroom scene introduced a lot of uh, people to African American vernacular English mm-hmm. which was like if if anyone is familiar that is that is AAVE um, and there are a lot is what a- AAVE, African American Vernacular English. Oh, I never heard that. Yep, it's okay. a real thing. It I exists. Didn't know that. Um, think about it this way: uh, there, there was actually a TikToker who was a black woman, and she said, "Get white gay men. Mm-hmm. When did a black woman enter your soul?" Oh, yes. And you know there are a lot of white gays out there yeah. that will use, and yes. white queer people that will use African American Vernacular English True. to. You know, spice up their personality. Yes. Like you'll see, you'll see like white gays going oh, or yes, God, or yes, Mama. That all started in the bullroom scene. Or, 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 oh no, she didn't. Or no, she better don't. <laughs> like this all started from black yes. talk. Yes. And um, the reason that that's brought up is because Maud actually bought a book. Yes, on black expressions. Black slang expressions. Yes. yes. Um, in this house, we try not to use African American vernacular English because it's not ours. And, you know, this really lays I into... slip sometimes, though. It, it, as, far, it, as far as being a drag queen, it's just, it's sort of like, it's just It lends there. itself. It, it, it it's lends there. itself. And, you know, and a lot of times you're doing shows and it's like... It just sort of happens. It just, yeah, it just happens. And audiences kind of expect it. It, it is true. Audience is kind of expected. But it's always nice to... Because there's cultural appropriation where people mm-hmm. will assume, oh, because you're a drag queen, that's yeah. how you talk. And yeah. then there's cultural appreciation where it's like, yes, this is how I talk, but this is where it came from. Right. This is where it originated. This is where it started. Um, yeah, and you don't get to use it if you're racist either. Yeah, you don't. I, okay. Exactly. You, you don't. Know. Yeah. Like when one of my personal favorites is when you'll see like white Karens call black people Shaniqua uh, or Shanene or t- uh, t- just yeah. just really leaning into the the negative stereotypes. Mm-hmm. So it's always important to like just be mindful of what yeah. you're saying and who you're around. Um, there have actually been times when I've like slipped and I like actually apologized and it, it's 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 one thing to use it. It's another thing to use it and then apologize for using it. Right. Um, yes. So again, just just one of those things to be mindful of because you know that 
This is this is how the episode starts. Yeah. It starts off with a really interesting note. Yes. Um, because Maud says, well, that's what I read in this this book of common black yeah. slang expressions. Yeah, yeah. And she says, what would I say to impress upon you favorably? Mm-hmm. And Florida says, what would you say? Oh, no. Florida says, yeah. um, maybe I ain't been black long as, as, as long as you <laughs> That was hysterical. That was funny. <laughs> that was really funny. That was very funny. Um, and, you know, jokes like that have been used where Florida was just like, I think she's becoming black by osmosis. Yes. <laughs> that was another example in an earlier episode. Um, so It was so funny how Florida was able to always call, call Maud out. out. She was always able stuff. to call Maud out on her BS. <laughs> because uh, Florida is a black woman. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, oh. so Florida says, well, if you really want to impress upon me favorably in the blackest ghetto, mm. I believe the term is Florida, why don't you take the rest of the day off? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> uh, to which Maud tells her. What does Maud tell her? <laughs> she tells her, God will get you for That's that, right. Florida. That's right. She says, God will get you for that, Florida. <laughs> And that was the only time God will get you for that uh, was mentioned in this episode. In this episode. And that's when we, we hear the doorbell. And, of course, Maud thinks that it's Carol and her new boyfriend. Yes, but it is not. But it is not. It is not. It, it is Vivian. It is dear old sweet Vivian. Poor, dear, Poor sweet Poor lonely Vivian. Vivian yes. Whom is still getting over the remnants of her divorce. From, uh... Chuck. Chuck. From Chuck. Yes. Getting divorced from Chuck. Yes. She, she's, come, she's come back, uh... She's come back for her vaporizer. Yeah, she gave her a vaporizer. And Vivian yeah. was very, um... Snar- almost a little snarky because mm. she immediately assumes because Maud was like, oh, I was expecting Carol, Carol and, her and her boyfriend. Who has a ba- baby face. Who has We've a very baby seen. face. Yes. I actually had to rewrite one of the lines, mm-hmm. but we'll, we'll get to that in a minute. All right. Um, I'll hold you to that. I, I'm sure you will. I don't I doubt that. I always do. So Vivian's just like, you can stop humming the wedding march. Right, right. And Maud ends up saying like a very interesting line where she says, oh, come on, Vivian, if... If all the Boy Scouts in the world that were living together mm. got married, there'd be... No. Mm. If all the mm. people... If all the campers... Right. Um, ...who lived together got married, there'd be an awful lot of Boy Scouts living together. Yes. That was the... That was the... I actually think yes. I have that one written down, as a matter of fact. Perhaps. And, uh, and there, there may actually be a lot of uh, former Boy yeah. Scouts living together. Mm-hmm. Probably. Actually, anecdotal, mm-hmm. um, I was a Boy Scout for all of two seconds. Oh, my God. Uh, because my <laughs> my church, it was St. Dominic's Church in Brooklyn. Um, uh, they had they had the sign up. My parents paid the money. Oh, Lord. Um, and we went for, I think, one and a half meetings, Ooh, and we were just yeah. not, we were just not into it. Um, the other problem was little seven-year-old Tom was very attracted to his, to his, uh, Boy Scout leader. Oh my. Because my Boy Scout leader was this sort of like huscular daddy with, uh-huh. uh, and I, I was just, so, it was the first time that I was like, something's off. <laughs> Something has changed within me. Something is not the same. <laughs> but but uh, yeah, the sweet mystery of life at last <laughs> I found you. At last, I know the secret of your arms. Yes. Um, We've all had that moment. But that was the one and only time I ever really delved into Boy Scouts until I started dating my ex, Max, who was it? Who was a so Boy what Scout. turned you off from the Boy Scouts? Just all we know of it. it wasn't the we know it wasn't the uh, it was the all of it. Year. It was it was just it was just all of it. There was a, there was like this I don't know there was this inherent dis, this inherent discomfort mm-hmm. that me and my brother had towards the whole operation. Oh, okay. And my brother was like three years younger than me, uh-huh. so he was I think in another meeting. Uh-huh. And I was just I don't know what possessed me to stop doing it, but uh-huh. I just there again I just felt uncomfortable. Yeah. And I think it had a lot to do with the fact that like my parents were asking, oh, do you want to go out tonight? And I was just like, no. No, I don't. Like, do you want to go to the meeting? And I was just like, no, I don't. Uh-huh. Not at all. Sorry. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. But that was the only time that I ever really, again, just delved into the world of the Boy Scouts. Mm-hmm. And then my sister became a Girl Scout and she like took it all the way to the end. Mm-hmm. I probably would have been, ha- uh, like, I never... Uh, I would have been happier as a Girl Scout. Than yeah, I, I never, Scout. like, tried to be a Boy Scout or anything. But if, if like, anything, I would have probably been happier. I, I would have probably liked being a Girl Scout more than more than anything. Correct. I didn't ever feel like uh, anything 
like bad was going to happen to um, you. No, I never felt like Judge? anything was like um, something I wanted to be a part of mm -hmm. in school until I got into theater. That makes sense. Yeah. That's the same with me. Yeah. Like, I really I mean, wasn't ascribed to anything until theater, and I was just like, yep, that's I where I gotta be. no desire for, like, sports to this day. I still don't understand how football works, and I don't I don't have a clue. Second and down, I don't care. First and goal, and I'm like, I who, who is she? Less. Who's first and goal? I could care. I could care less, and as far as, like, any, anything sports, not interested, unless it's figure skating. Yeah. <laughs> But although I will say this, there are times when me and my girlfriend Laura will um, will watch the Olympics and mm -hmm. we'll just like critique all the gorgeous bodies that we see. And that's well, it. that's that's yeah, it. Fair. That's the only yeah, reason why we're like, yeah. who won the gold? Who cares? Who's yes. got the greater six pack? Yes. Uh, so uh, back to the episode. Vivian, she needs her vaporizer. Yes. For her asthma attack. Yeah. And Maud's like, you know. Well, I don't understand. Why would Chuck take the vi vaporizer? You're, You're the, the one with the asthma with the asthma. And she's like... You just answered your own question. Exactly. So, yeah. So, so that's, not for nothing, Vivian was pretty pathetic in this episode. Yeah, like a real, like, um, dish rag. Very much. A wet you know? towel. Wet Very towel. much a wet blanket. Yeah. I mean... So Arthur and Walter come in. I think they were golfing. Yes, because Arthur enters screaming for... Yeah. And uh, we do hear that... Uh, uh, Walter, he's making drinks, he's making, he's getting them ginger ale. That was, I did notice that. Yes. Well, the, again, one of the beautiful things that I enjoyed about Maud was that they paid attention to continuity. Yeah. They paid attention, and obviously you're not going to have a big alcoholic episode, right. and then right. immediately, like, afterwards, like, yes. they start mixing drinks. Yeah. But I think it was important for them to, like... Make that distinction. Make that Distinction that he was getting them ginger ales, or was it like Maud who said, "Oh, I'll, 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 I'll split a ginger I'll, ale I'll with you." Ginger ale with you, so you knew because they still had the bar. Yeah, they still had the bar. Just you right. know, so you 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 knew that you know they he wasn't drinking. Correct. So I mean, because it would have been like after you know starting the season with like with a big alcoholic episode where yeah. like folk, where that's the focal point if, that's the story line. if they had just went if they had just ignored that and had him drinking it would have been like the golden girls yeah exactly <laughs> so the last because Dorothy had a gambling addiction and she had chronic fatigue syndrome and it was never mentioned again after those right. episodes right so uh we don't need to we don't need to pause do we no we don't need to pause oh okay no no no, no. we don't need to pause at all <laughs> So, moving gaily forward, um, oh, so Vivian is like, um, she's kind of like standing there and she's like, it's very apparent, she wanted to like be offered a drink. She wanted to be offered a drink. She wanted, she wanted to be, be included. Involved. And she wanted to be involved. And, you know, so she's very much like, um, well, I really have to be running along and, you know, and, and she's sort of like trying to drag out uh -huh. the, the, the goodbyes and saying, well, you know. Wish you know. T tell Carol I said hello and I wish her well. And it's and like nobody is. No one's picking no one's, up on it. No one is picking up what she's putting down. Yes. Um, and then like Arthur says, uh, isn't it true? Like, um, oh goodness. Well, then they sort of set up for because Vivian offers uh, Arthur like um, a home cooked meal. Yes. Yes, so. Vivian Arthur's a free home cooked meal to Arthur, and Arthur just pays it no mind. Right, just pays it absolutely zero mind. Right, um, but he also mentions like how his Agnes died, and yes, yes, you know, it's unfortunate because mm -hmm. like they they for a woman that's dead, they use her as a punchline an awful lot. I don't have they. I don't ever remember her being brought up. Before this, later on, later, later on, later on in the series, okay, like they, so this... Agnes becomes a Agnes becomes a punchline. Okay. See, I didn't even realize he was a widower up until now. I yeah, that was did they mention I think, being honestly, a widower? I think this might have been this might have been the first time that they mentioned Agnes. So I because up until this point, I wasn't sure if I thought he was a he, he had been divorced. Nope, but he wasn't divorced. He was He's, a divorced. He's a widower. He's a widower because they never really. They never dived into that yeah. until, until... But see, it's the second season, so now they're yes. starting to find their they're, footing, they're and they're fleshing, finding, things, they're out fleshing out things out a little bit more. more. Yes. Um, so, Arthur is commenting about poor Vivian, um, because uh, she doesn't, you know, she didn't have a... She's got nobody now. Yep. Um, 
And I think that's when they start talk, discussing about uh, Carol and her new boyfriend, Chris. Yep. Who happens to I, be honestly, a pediatrician. One of my one of my favorite jokes was when Maud said, think of how good Agnes must feel because, you know, yes. Agnes is dead. Yeah. Yeah. But she doesn't have to deal with Arthur. Yeah. And I mean, who wants to deal with Arthur? Exactly. Another thing that happened in the episode was Arthur saying, I've been telling you for years, Vivian, to stop smoking because she had the respirator. Yes, yes. And Vivian said, I've never yeah. smoked a day in my life. Yeah. So, again, just Arthur being... A douche. A douche. Yes. Don't like him. Yes. Don't like him at all. Yeah, well, um, yeah, that was Arthur's role. <laughs> That's, so. fun. I, I, that's funny. I, I, I'm, because I'm, I'm so pretentious, um, I actually have the script that I wrote. And one of the things that was um, Walter saying, have you stopped humming the wedding march, Maud? Because, oh, yeah, again, yeah. I also didn't have Vivian. Yes. The opening joke to that was, would you rather I hum a funeral procession in your honor, Walter? Uh. <laughs> um, well, so, so at this point then, now we start getting into the... The... The episode. The yeah, episode. where where the thing is that the 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 issue at heart is that Carol and this boyfriend mm-hmm. are having an adult relationship. relationship outside of marriage. Yes, and you know, obviously, you know, they went away for a couple days camping mm-hmm. together, and obviously, you know, they're sleeping together. Here's so here's where things get a little sticky for me. Um, because, you know, Maud says to Vivian, he's adorable, he's 30, but he has this baby face baby that face. makes him look tops 17. 17. Yeah. Which, I'm like, Maud, yeah. are you coveting a 17-year-old face? Mm-hmm. Are you doing that right now? Is mm-hmm. that what's happening? Yeah. So I actually changed it to 18 for the mm-hmm. sake of my own sanity. Um, I hear you. Well, yeah. not, not, not to change, not to go on a completely different Oh, tangent. that's completely and totally fine. But I have no problem with that. I... We 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 had this um, uh, discussion when I told you mm-hmm. that I was doing um, the song "It's Beginning to Look Like Christmas," mm-hmm. which has the line uh, "A pair of hop along boots, boots and a uh, whistle and a pistol that shoots and a pistol that shoots." Mm-hmm. And I told you, I said, you know, I don't really feel comfortable, you know, in today's climate to sing that a yep. pistol that shoots. And so, uh, in talking with you, I, I, end, I ended up changing it to a camera, camera that, that shoots. shoots. Um, cause a ca- a camera does sh- cause shoots. a camera shoots. A it, camera you know, shoots. takes pictures. You Listen, call it. the amount of times as a, as a cosplayer and a drag queen that I've said to people and it's just like, I have this new costume, who wants to shoot me? Mm-hmm. Right. It's just, yeah. it's common, it's common right. expression. Right. Yeah. But, um, you know, and especially, I mean... Well, that's all we hear on the news is about like is about another school uh, shooting, school shootings, and another things like that. Here, so to me, shooting. it's like singing a song where you're talking about giving a, a kid, you know, even if it's a toy pistol. Look um, what happened in Michigan. Yeah, I mean, I'm just like I'm not. I was like I'm not comfortable with that. Oh, I have a. Oh my God, why? Uh, why would I? Say, why, uh, you know, something. It's there. It's fine. Me and my family were having a conversation about this, mm-hmm. and my father, whom just gets progressively more and more racist as the oh days Lord. go by, um, insisted that uh, the suspect be shot until he found out the, that the suspect, suspect was, was white. white. Okay, because he was like, they should have shot him. He should be put to death. He should be this. As soon as it was turned around, oh well, I wonder what led him to do that. And I'm like, ah! Oh, <laughs> yeah. That's my life. Oh. That's my life. Any who's will be. Any who's. So that's, the, the, that's yes. the gist of what. One of the things that like we have to do as creators is we yeah. sometimes have to change things for the sake of our own sanity and for the yeah. sake of for the, sake of the uh, juxtaposition of the song. Yeah, like you'll, yeah. you'll see it one and way, you, and then you'll... you when you read it when you and you when you were filming this, you felt you needed to make that change from. A you seventeen know, year old to an eighteen year old, an 18 and I completely old. and totally cut out that that opening bit of dialogue between Florida, Florida and Maud, right. just because again it can be looked at as problematic in today's society and in today's yeah. political climate. Very true. So, so as, yes. you know, as um, thinking human beings, we we you know we tend to err on the side of caution. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you know, not wanting to, you know. Offend or you know or be offensive and correct you know so at one hundred percent I completely and totally yes, yes all that so now Arthur feels that it's you know um, 
uh, morally wrong that Carol and her boyfriend. Yep, because he says we're well, having they're, they're relations like, outside of marriage. They're outside camping, huh? Well, yeah. well, well. And of course, Maud says Carol's twenty-seven, Chris, Chris is 30, thirty, and this is nineteen seventy-three. So why, you know, uh, why why did they? You know, he said, "In my day and age, there would have been a chaperone. A chaperone, a chaperone real, yeah, really." And Maud comes back at him, saying, "In your day and age, girls wore hoop skirts." Yes. And Walter, surprisingly enough, got some pretty witty dialogue in this one. Yes. Um, he said, "You know, uh, which is probably why they needed a chaperone. A girl yeah. in a hoop skirt is so easy to tip over." It's true. <laughs> it's tragic. It's true. Let me tell you, when I'm wearing one of those A-line dresses with like four crinolines underneath. It's it, I, it, can, it can be hazardous. I love a hoop skirt as much as the next girl, but damn, just no, no, do not want, does not want, yes, does not. But want. you know what the beauty of it is, though, you don't have to worry about tucking. That's true. That's very <laughs> true. When, you know, whenever I dress up as a character that like wears crinolines or wears like. Um, oh my god, why can't I think of the word? Petticoat. A petticoat or a hoop skirt. You don't have to talk. No. It's a nice feeling. You can just go commando. <laughs> you can just let them fly. Yeah, exactly. Let them no fly. One, no let your legs know. play volleyball. No one will, <laughs> no one will know. So Walter's talking, uh, Arthur's talking about moral collapse. Oh my god. And he yes. brings up a moral uh, collapse Ingrid, of our society. Ingrid Bergman, who, you know, sh she... Caused quite a scandal. Yeah. In her day, she ran off with uh, an Italian with director, Roberto Rossellini. That's that who, was that was who it was, Roberto yeah, Rossellini. Yes, because her her daughter um, Isabella Isabella Rossellini, Rossellini you know, was uh, the um, uh, one of her, her daughters that she had with Roberto product of Rossellini. product of the tryst. Yes, and you know, because she was she was Ingrid Bergman was married to someone else at the time. Yeah. And it caused um, it. Caused a big scandal. Yeah, and she, like you said, she didn't work in because a sexually years. liberated woman terrified the men. Mm -hmm. Any type of listen, Mae West, may she rest in peace, was one of the first sexually liberated women mm -hmm. next to mm -hmm. uh, Jean Harlow, mm -hmm. and you know the the network censors really became a thing because you know. Moral, it's a it's a moral obligation to be you know discreet and yes. to be you know flowery and feminine and it's just yes. like no women have the same desires as men do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, Maud is you know she's going on that they're consenting adults. Yeah. Arthur is saying that there is no discipline that that's it for America and, he's and that's going, another thing I disapprove of working mothers. Working mothers. Like. Yeah. <laughs> This is the rantings and ravings of a conservative in the 70s. Yeah. yeah. And it's nice to know that those things still have not changed. Not Look at the too. Dugars. Oh, God. Look at all that mess. Oh, yeah. I never watched them. Neither I mean, did I. I felt I did not need to watch I them. Saw through, I, saw th I saw through them just through the ads. Yes, correct. Um, you know, we. Yeah. We love we love the Christian right in this mm -hmm. house. Not. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Anyway. Yes. Moving gaily forward. Gaily forward. Um, yeah, Maud says at that point, if this is a conversation between two consenting adults, I have just stopped consenting. Exactly, exactly. Um, I think Arthur, he's, he's even bringing up uh, Nixon. Yep, President Nixon may have his faults, but he put it in a nutshell when he said the average American is just like a child, which yeah. Maud retorts, he was just talking about his advisors. His advisors, yeah. I believe this was uh, before Nixon, okay. Watergate hit. I'm just going to say this here and now. Nixon and Reagan bankrupted this country. Oh, for, for sure. Ru ruined, yeah. like, the ruined urban neighborhoods, ruined queer living, mm -hmm. ruined the economy mm -hmm. in any which way they saw fit. And mm -hmm. it's just, mm -hmm. and, oh my God! Mm -hmm. Oh my God! Mm -hmm. Do you see all of the backlash that Nancy Reagan is finally getting? No, I haven't, <gasps> I haven't seen that. Oh when, my what, God! What happened? So many people have come to find out that Nancy Reagan was quite promiscuous in her day, oh. and how she was very well known for giving amazing head. Oh, well. There was actually someone who said Nancy well, Reagan. Is that how you get a pearl necklace? <laughs> In more oh, ways than one. In more ways than one. Mm. Uh, there was actually a meme that said Nancy Reagan was only five six, but her throat was six foot six. 
<laughs> and I about died. Oh, my Lord. Just say no. Just say no. No, oh, you just you say just, no, Nancy. Well, you she was only talking no. about drugs. That's it. Yeah. She okay. was only talking about drugs. She <laughs> said that. That's yeah. where the D.A.R.E. program came into play. Uh, but, yes, Nancy Reagan is finally getting her just desserts uh, in death. And we're, we're, oh, we stand. We stand in this house. But, yeah, that's the big thing now that people are poking fun at Nancy Reagan about because, yeah. you know. And they go on about, you know, what a wonderful president Reagan was. But uh, look at, um, you know, all the all the people who died from AIDS that, you know, they, they during their Nothing. administration, they Nothing. just turned a blind eye they to They turned a blind eye to it. They did not care. Yeah. And we lost, you know, it. it it's really one of those moral things where the, the 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 Christian Republican right, the Christian conservative right, will say, "Oh, pro life, we're pro life, we're pro life." No, you're not. No. You're pro life if the child no. is, you know, you're pro life. You're not. You're not pro life. You're anti woman. They they only care about the the child while it's in utero. Yep. Once it's out, they no, they don't care. I mean, oh, please, we can we can go on that tangent for. Eons, Ugh, eons, true, eons, 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 we could. All right. So anyway, I think at this point, Arthur, did Arthur leave and, and Carol and Chris came in? Um, He said, yeah, after, you know, so that's it for America. Another attack on the president and a complete whitewash for Vanessa Redgrave and working mothers. Mm -hmm. And then he left because mm -hmm. finally. Um, someone says, Walter, for the life of me, I cannot understand how you picked me as a wife. Right, right. And somebody like Arthur is a best friend. Right. And he says, well, the beat's having it the other way around. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and at that point, Walter's like, Arthur's not always wrong. Right. So yeah. that's sort of the catalyst of the entire episode. Yeah. Because it just, you know, it continues to point out mm -hmm. one's hypocrisy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, at that point, Carol and Chris enter mm -hmm. uh, out of the woods and into the pollution. Yes. <laughs> And Maud is just so taken with Chris's so baby taken face. with Chris's baby. She is squeezing, squeezing his baby pussycat yeah. face. And now, by the by the way, of course, I don't know if we said it that Chris was played by Fred Grandy. Yes, who Chris played was, Gopher? On who the played Love Gopher Boat. on the Love Boat? And also, went who I had into a politics. Who I had a crush on when you know I was a, I was a young, when I was a little boy watching the the Love Boat. You know, I'm trying to think if I ever had any crushes on like 19. Any type of show from the 1970s, and there really wasn't. I, I'm trying to think of the first boy that I had a crush on when it came to, because all of the girls that I went to school with, like Jonathan Taylor, JTT, <laughs> uh, and I can't think of anybody else that really. Oh, Leonardo DiCaprio was another like heartthrob, and they just did nothing for me. The first, I want. Okay, I know the first, Chris O'Donnell. Oh, okay. Oh, did I have a crush on Chris okay. O'Donnell? Him in the Robin suit, I was just mm -hmm. like, yup, that, mm hmm See, I was never into, like, um, like, teen idols. Like, really? Like, yeah. you didn't like the monkeys, or? Well, I, I did, but, but I was, but it was like, um, well, the monkeys were a little bit before me, as. <gasps> no. Now I know who I had a crush on from the who? 70s. Who? Um, it was the one between Greg and Bobby. Peter. 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 Uh -oh. Peter was the middle child, right? Yes. The one who had the, the voice cracking. When it's time to change. Y yes. Yes. I had a crush on him. Okay. I never had a thing for the... for the uh, Anybody in the Brady Bunch? Um, Mr. Brady. <laughs> you know! That's the thing. I was always attracted to, to older guys. Really? Yes. Well, that's as a, explains as a, a as a lot. As, especially as, like, as a little boy. Yeah. One of my big 70s crushes was Patrick Duffy when he played the man from Atlantis. And he was, he was you know... Uh, yeah, I don't know if you ever saw the show. It was, no. it was he played. This is before he was on Dallas. Okay, he played. This, they found him. He was he was amnesiac, and they they theorized because he could he could breathe underwater, and yeah. he had like webbed webbed Web hands, feet and and, webbed hands. You know, and he wore he just wore this little yellow speedo, and I I was I was like quite taken. Oh my! I was glued <laughs> to that TV set. <laughs> I mean, my parents just thought I just I just liked you know the show because it was like science fiction and all, but okay, my, okay. my hormones were in overdrive for, for Patrick <laughs> Duffy as the man from Atlantis. Uh, an another another one of my older crushes yes. was Barry Gibb from from the Bee Gees. Honestly, same. Yeah. Spe especially you know they wore those shirts that when they they were completely open where hair and he had and that chest, hairy chest. Were, were a thing of beauty and a thing of virility. Also, Andy Gibb. 
Because I, rem- oh, I remember, I remember it was a very good looking. There guy. was this poster of him that I would always see in the mall, and he was like, he had no shirt on. I mean, again, hey, hairy chest, and, and he had the treasure trail, and he had the treasure trail going, going down from the navel. And I can remember like walking in the mall with my mother, and I I could see that post. They had a bookstore that sold posters, and that poster was like. Uh, on the display box of like the posters, yeah. So you could see, and I can remember like we're walking, and I just got slower and, and slower because I was like staring at it, <laughs> but I didn't want to let my mother know that I was like staring, you know. So I'm just like walking slower. And slower. My mother's like, "Come on, what are you? What are you? Why are you walking so slow?" It's, it's, it. You know, it's it's really <laughs> interesting because kids and. Uh, uh, Teenagers and sex will always be a thing that gets, you know, written as a joke. Yeah. Um, but it is true. I mean, years ago, you would have kids who were... During the 80s, there was Elvira. During the 70s, there was um, Farrah Fawcett. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it wasn't until, like, Charlie's... Like, the 70s were really a time for sexual liberation. Yeah. And it only continued to progress as mm-hmm. as time goes mm-hmm. on. And I mean, nowadays you have like you have Magic Mike, and you mm-hmm. have. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of like an example. Yeah, we didn't have that in the set. We had the, in we, the 70s. We had, of that. we had the Sears catalog <laughs> and the men's underwear. And the men's underwear section. section. <laughs> That's what I had. All, also, a big 70s crush, John Ritter on Three's Company. Oh, in the earlier episodes, the sometimes they episodes. had him walking around in, in like really in, tight in, pants. Not just that, there were there were a few of the early episodes where he was in like bikini briefs and like a t shirt on, and I guess they must have gotten complaints. Oh, they had. Because then have. they stopped they doing that. But oh my god! And they goodness. also thought that they like Mr. Roper being not Mr. Roper, um, Mr. Mr. Furley, Mr. Furley, Mr. Furley. Yeah, Mr. Furley. They there was questions about him being a little too flamboyant. Yes. And that was like, did it start with Mr. Roper and Mrs. Roper? It started and with the Ropers. Then became Mr. Furley. Because then they get, they spun off into their own series. Really? Yeah, they had their own series. I never last. knew that. Yes, the Ropers. Yes. Well, that's they had their and Mr. Furley took he bought the building, and he became Isn't the landlord. That yes, yes. But yeah, John Ritter was very John Ritter. He was very good looking in mm-hmm. his day. Mm-hmm. Very. Very good looking. And Wasn't there... I'm trying to remember. I'm almost positive there was one scene where his pants split open. No, there was a scene I think he had on boxers and supposedly you could, you know, his his junk became exposed. Wasn't it during... Because I, I, I remember distinctly there was one scene where he was in the hammock and the hammock like flipped over because that was... In terms of physical comedy, mm. that was gold. Yes. That was that was gold. Yeah. Like I think that was probably one of the longer laughs in mm-hmm. the series. Mm-hmm. And I remember distinctly them saying like th- one of his pants like split open during that scene mm-hmm. that they had to constantly keep re-recording it because they were just that tight. Could could be. I think I again you can email us at Findlay's Friendly Appliances at gmail.com and correct us if you so choose. You know. They certainly um with that show, I mean they certainly had no problems with um, exploiting Suzanne Summers' obviously. sexiness, obviously, and also John Ritter's sexiness. Yeah, you know, they they had no problem with it, and you know, you know, it's funny. Out of out of the three of them, I always enjoyed Joyce Duet. Yeah, she was good. I always felt like she was like a really she was a mainstay in that yeah. show. It's just so unfortunate what's happened to her post yeah. Three's Company, like yeah. between the drugs and yeah. the alcoholism, and I think she was like arrested for theft or she was arrested oh, for drug drug abuse. Just oh. It, it, it. Oh lord. Where are they now? Where are they now? <laughs> oh, so Maud is going crazy over Chris's baby yep, face. Yeah, two year old face. skin. That I have face. I have not seen skin like that since the that last time, time I diapered Carol. Yes. And uh, they, they have a, a present for Maud. Yes, and it's a walleye pike. It's a walleye pike. But Maud is unsure what to do. What to do with the, what with to the do walleye with pike. Yes. Um, and there's and something about the pike being anti-Nixon. Yep, she's just saying that. Be, be, she said at least it came wrapped in the New York Times. Yes, yes. Um, and Walter says she's just saying that because they're anti-Nixon. Yes. To which Maud retorts, I didn't know walleye pike were anti-Nixon. They were anti-Nixon, yes. Then again, why should I be surprised? Um, so at that point, Maud insists that Chris stay for dinner. Um, and he's Chris saying says he's got, a long, he's got drive. a long drive to Boston. Yeah. 
So, so Maude, Maude suggests, mm-hmm. why don't you spend the night Stay with us and night. get up early and leave then? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So Chris is just like, well, I'd really like to leave and not have to worry about any of this. But before he even has an opportunity to get that out of his face, mm. Maud says, come now. You're going on that medical seminar up in Canada. They're not going to see each other for at least a month. Right. And, you know, Maud is a relatively intelligent woman. She knows that her daughter and Chris are, like, being intimate with each other. So, mm. obviously, she would suggest, why don't you just stay? Yeah, why don't you just stay the night? But we come, the moral dilemma doesn't happen until later. Uh, yes, yes. So, but, but, and it, it's, of course, like everything, you know, Maud does something and... Maud it's gonna come it. back and bite her in the ass. Yeah, well, yes, because that was that yes. was how, that was how it was written. It was right. always written to like sort of the 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 militant feminist always needed a foil, mm-hmm. always needed a foible, and that was that mm-hmm. was what happened in this this episode. So I think both Maud and Walter went into the kitchen. Maud and Walter go into the kitchen to and check on dinner. Carol and, and Chris were were kissing, and then yeah. Walter comes back in. He sees them kissing and they're completely oblivious. That, honestly, that was a really cute moment. Yes. I think that was a really cute moment. Like, he's in, he's coming back into the kitchen after Chris and Carol are, like, making out and kissing and so on. And he's shaking the bucket shaking of the ice. ice. He's just like, hey, kids. Yes. Kids, stop it. Yeah. One is just in the Take other room. Take Yes. So, um, at that point, I think Walter suggests that since Chris is staying the night, why don't they go and take the rest of the stuff out of Chris's uh, camper? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And as they're leaving, Walter's like shooting eyes at Carol. It was, yeah. it was a really cute moment. Like yes. I, re- I really enjoyed that. So then, meanwhile, back in the in the kitchen. Oh, well, we, even before that, because Chris, while Chris and Carol were together, uh, Chris turns to Carol and says, would you still love me if I didn't have oh, this the skin? baby face. That, that baby, yes. And she says, no. Kid. No, yes. She says, no. No. <laughs> Fair. I felt that was fair. So we're back in the we're back in the kitchen. Maud is staring at the fish. At the fish. She's um, trying to pawn it off on she's, Florida. She's trying to pawn it off on Florida. And the face that Esderol makes where she's like, what do you want me to do with this? Yes. She's like, it wasn't like, oh, oh, do you want to take it? And she's like, on the bus? Yeah. <laughs> and she says she'll hang it out. The, she said, I'll yeah. hang it out the bus. Yeah. <laughs> So at that point, uh, Maud says to Florida, would you mind going into the guest room and changing, changing the, sheets? the sheets? Because Chris is going to spend Chris the night. Chris is spending, spending the night. And obviously, as far as Maud knows, he's going to be he's staying gonna stay in, in the, the guest room. Bedroom. So she thinks. So at that point, I think... Um, <laughs> the the joke that I wrote in this. Okay, Maud, just promise me you won't diaper his face before tucking him in. Yeah, right. I had I had Maud say God'll get you for that, that Walter. Walter. <laughs> um So Florida she exits the kitchen and yes, uh, Florida she's exits on her the way kitchen. to change the sheets and Carol, Carol stops her. Carol stops her and says, Oh, by the way, Florida, would you mind putting men's hangers in men's my bedroom? Hangers in the bed. What are men's hangers? I think they're just hangers for men's blazers, I think. I'm not 100%. What do you need a hanger for a blazer for? They were coming back from camping. I don't know. Aren't hangers uh, unisex? Aren't they gender neutral? Not in the 70s, apparently. I don't remember. But I th- honestly, I think, and women's I think a men's hanger is what you would traditionally see in like men's warehouse, where it would be you have the hanger and then you have that little middle piece where you could put the pants the over. The pants, maybe. And I think that would be what a traditional men's okay. hanger would be. All right. But obviously, he didn't need those. He was in jeans and he was like in a jeans t-shirt. and a t shirt. But, you know, Florida's well, the purpose of the, stairs, of the plot. For the purpose of the plot. We needed that. So, because Florida now realizes that Maud is foreseeing Chris staying in the guest bedroom, mm-hmm. and Carol mm-hmm. is foreseeing Chris is staying in Carol's bedroom. And, and, is, and as Florida, this is where the dilemma begins. Yes, yeah, Florida <laughs> is a few a few steps up on the staircase when it hits her. And she stops. <laughs> she stops herself and she says, I don't want to be here when this happens. This yeah, I hope no, the bus, the whole I hope my bus, bus is, is on time. time. This ain't going to be no place for an innocent, innocent bystander. bystander. Yes. She, she, Florida, now she's, she foresees it all. She knows that it is going to hit the fan. Oh my God. Uh, <laughs> Do you want to hear the joke that I wrote, Walter? Yes. 
So it's the same thing. So when I wrote this, I unfortunately did not have my Florida with me. So I had to make Walter were, the one to like change the sheets in the guest bedroom and also free. do that. So Florida, I was Florida. I was unfortunately Florida less. Florida less. Um, and I so so Walter says, I think I'm going to take that fish out to the park tonight. Mm. Something tells me this isn't going to be a good place for a reformed alcoholic or a wall-eyed pike. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Very true. I'm witty sometimes. Sometimes. <laughs> God will get you for that, Tony. <laughs> he always does. Yeah. <laughs> uh. So at that point, oh. Maud starts setting the table, mm -hmm. and Carol's mm -hmm. like, oh, you're using the good china for Chris. Mm -hmm. So yes. Maud's like, of course. I, if, I, if he steals, I don't want him to think we're cheap. That's right. Um, so Carol and Maud are having a mother-daughter conversation, and That's Maud right. is insistent that yes. they're going to be married. Yeah, so she's like, saying, about your wedding bells? Wedding bells. Wedding bells. And I think Carol says that only time will tell. Yep. And Maud says that's a lovely expression. As There's also said, that other expression about time. It's later, later than, than you think. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um... I think that's when Florida... That's when Florida comes in comes and she goes, down. I changed the sheets in the guest bedroom like, like you, you asked for, Maud. Mr. And Finley. I put men's hangers in your room like you, you asked, asked for, Carol. Carol. And may the best the room win. win. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> And I think Maud goes... Carol and Maud now have that moment yeah. where like, Maud's like, why why did you have men's hangers be put in your room? And Carol's like, well, why did you want, want the, the, the sheets in the guest bedroom? bedroom? And Maud says, because they were dirty. Yeah. <laughs> um, so at that point, it finally comes out like, um, Mother, you do realize that Chris is staying so we can be together. Yeah. Obviously insinuating that they're going to be saying, sleeping in the same bed. Right. Um, and Maud finally starts to have that, like, twist where it's like, I'm now panicking. Because right. I did not think that my, my daughter's boyfriend was going to be spending the night in her bedroom. Right. And Carol's like, you know, you're not upset, are you? And of course, Maud then goes into her, like, oh, I'm, I, her, I'm a modern woman. Yes, I'm, I'm emancipated. A modern, I'm emancipated. She's putting on that, that veneer. Yeah. That, that that front, like she's putting on her shield. She's, yeah, she's putting her guard up right now. Yes. Which I mean, as a mother during the seventies, I completely and totally understand that. Listen, there are times. So okay, my brother, when he was with his girlfriends, because mm -hmm. he had several, mm -hmm. they would come over mm -hmm. and they would chill. And because I was out of work at the time, I would, you know, hear the conversations, and uh -huh. I would, you know, not that. Not that anything dirty would happen, but there would be times when they would go up to my brother's bedroom, and I'm uh -huh. like, is, is my mother okay with this? Like, is that... Was is, she home? No! Oh. My mother was not... Nobody was home except uh -huh. me! I was the only schmuck that was home. Uh-huh. Um, so, there were times when my brother would have that over, uh -huh. and then when I started dating my partner, I would be terrified mm. if my boyfriend came over and just like chilled because I'm like I, I, I would not be I would not mm -hmm. be comfortable with any of that mm -hmm. because it's my mother's house mm -hmm. like I would feel terrible doing anything like mm -hmm. yes kissing fine mm -hmm. whatever but anything past that I would right. feel I would feel awful right I would feel awful now here's here's the thing though um we're, we're automatically assuming, just because Chris and Carol, or Maud is, assuming that Chris and Carol are going to are, have they're sex. Gonna, they're going to have sex just because they're, they're, they're in bed together. But I mean, think of, on the other hand, think about the fact that Carol and Chris aren't going to see each other for a month. Right. Right. So you you would think that they that they're going to be you would surmise that they're yeah. going to be intimate with each other, especially right. because of the amount of time that they're not going to be together. True. True. But on the other hand, it's sort of like knowing parents are in the next bedroom, it's that's a that's a mood killer. That's, that's it's moral. It's a moral dilemma. It's like, like not even a, that it's a moral dilemma. It's just I call it a moral that, dilemma. I don't know. For me it's just like it's kind it's just like a, you know, a, a, it's just like a mood killer. You know, it's it's like, you know, well, you know, <laughs> can't really be as loud as you want. And if you do start to do it, there's you, always the possibility. Like, that was... The bed is creaking. Or so the there was a conversation <laughs> that Tony and I were having earlier about a um, a, a gentleman that I was that I was intimate with. But I, we, did, that we never had sex. So let me preface that. But 
we almost did. Mm. And he said to me, uh-huh. I really don't feel comfortable taking you to my house because there is a there is a hundred percent chance that my mother is going to walk in afterwards oh. and say, I have breakfast ready for the both of you. Ah. And that Yee. was one of the reasons why I did not yeah. spend the night at his place. Yeah. yeah. Because I would feel uncomfortable horrendous yeah i would feel incredibly uncomfortable if like the two of us were woken up by his mother who was also a professionally trained opera singer why i always recommend dating orphans (laughs) (laughs) or people whose parents are dead (laughs) (laughs) almost the same thing Oh, you disaster. You absolute nightmare. Oh, Lord. So, so Maud is like, Maud an is emancipated bereft. woman. Maud is bereft. And she says, I- I've got I've got to go back in the in, into the bedroom to finish finish dinner. Yep. That was a third. She kept... Why don't the two of you just sit down and relax and I'll go into the bedroom and check on... I mean yeah, the, the kitchen. She means the kitchen. Uh, so Chris asks, like, is your mother uptight about him about me staying the mm-hmm, night? Mm-hmm. She goes, no, my yeah. mother's the most modern woman I know. And then there's a yeah. crash. Yes. There's a crash a heard crash. in the kitchen. So at that point, Walter comes back from uh, helping Chris pack from the camper. And, you know, Walter... He well, he goes into the kitchen. He does. That's so when he he goes in after Maud comes out and says, "Dinner will be ready in just a few minutes." So Carol asks, "Are you upset that you're not upset that Chris and I are staying, right?" And she goes, "I'm not. I mean, no, I'm, I'm not. I'm not." But uh, I but remember Walter went into the kitchen. Remember she was peeling the yep. celery yep. like a mad woman. <laughs> Fu- I wrote down furiously peeling. He's like peeling, peeling that celery, celery to the point where it's, it's like there's not going to be anything left. There's not going to be any celery of the left. Celery. So uh, Walter asks, "Are you bothered by them staying?" She's like, "I'm not bothered." Yeah. And w- Walter's trying to be compassionate yeah. and understanding. And uh. God bless Walter and his patience. <laughs> yeah, it was so. Uh, kind of unusual for Walter to be the more logical, he's the thinker. more laid laid back, like easygoing one in this. As far as like Carolyn, Crystal, they'll stay in Carol's room. What's mm-hmm. the big deal? They're they're adults, you know. Yeah. So, so Maud says, "I'm not bothered. Why should I be bothered? I'm a completely modern mother. Carol is 27. Chris is 30, mm-hmm. and this is 1973." And falls into Walter's arms, okay. saying, not unto my own not roof. my own roof. Oh, my goodness. So at that point, we cut to commercial, and we come back. Oh, yes. To, Maud, to a treat. To, to a treat. To Maud singing the, the final notes of... You Are My Sunshine. You Are My Sunshine. And she is singing slowly. Yeah. She is singing very slowly. So don't take my sunshine away. And sustains mm. for much longer than she and should. And then went on to like more reprises. Chris is, Chris, Chris and Carol, Carol are and, trying to get up. And Walter, are they're like stuck on the couch. They are stuck on the couch just looking at the whatever. Just yes. Stone so, so face. You, yeah, you know, like, you know, this is all part of this has to be the to keep them from going Perhaps to bed. The, the 20th stanza of yes. You Are My Sunshine. Yes. Yes. Um, and one of the, another one of the things that I love is at the end of the song, like Maud goes, one more time, no, please one don't take time. my sunshine away. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> uh. And I love when B. Arthur did that. I adored when B. Arthur like went into that really low register, especially mm-hmm. because you know there weren't that many singers other than Tallulah Bankhead yes. who who hit notes that low. True. Or Marlena Dietrich was another one who sang in a very Bassy baritone voice. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So we f- we find out that Maud's been playing that song for, for hours. hours, hours. So you know, I'm not the least bit tired. You know, I could go on like this for hours. That was what Maud said. Walter well, says yes. you already have. Why don't you yes. let the kids go upstairs? Right. So Maud is now trying to avoid sending them to bed at at all, all costs. Um, Which I don't. They were both look so exhausted at this point. I don't know what she was worried about. Neither do I. But then again, you know, Maud is Maud. Yeah. So Carol says, I'm going to bed. Maud says, no, no. don't. Um, so Chris at that point was like, I'm I'm understanding. Like, I, I get what you're trying to do. Right. 
So Maud immediately says, that's right, charade! You charade. must have been reading my mind. Yes. So Walter at that point is now like... He takes over. He, he takes he, initiative. He's like, oh, here, I, I've got a good one. I love charades, Walter yes. says. And Maud's like, you mean you want to play? Mm -hmm. And Walter's like, sure, but I want to go first. Yes. So Maud and Walter play this absolutely hysterical game of, of charades. charades. And, you know, Maud is like, don't worry, kids, we got this, because she's starting to figure it out. Right. We come to find out that the word is good, good night. night. And Maud is deliriously happy. Like, I figured it out. Yeah. And Walter does this beautiful physical comedy routine yes. where he is, like, trying to get Maud to say... Good night. And honestly, there's a part of me that wants to say that it was not rehearsed. I want to believe that that scene wasn't rehearsed. You think? I, I truly do. I don't know. I don't think so. You think it was rehearsed? Back then, it was like it was like everything. I mean, everything was rehearsed. Everything was rehearsed. True. I mean, they and from the, the I Love Lucy playbook. Lucy rehearsed until she was blue and in the especially face. B, B Arthur being the consummate professional that yeah, she is. Coming true. from the theater background, she would not have been the one to just want to like off the cuff. True. That would be more Betty White's thing. Yes, exactly. I think Betty. Yeah, yeah. yeah you're right. You're right. So you're right. I, you know, I'm sure there was some. Mm -hmm. mm, you know, a little uh, spontaneity. Spontaneity. There may have been a little bit of improv, improvisation. But not a lot. There, but, there might have been a little improvisation, but not but a lot. Not a lot. I'm sure, like the the bones for all that were were well set in place. So um, we come to find out that Walter was trying to get Maud to say good night. Right. She says good night, and she is elated. The elation mm -hmm. in in Maud's face that she mm -hmm. got it right. Mm -hmm. And Walter says good night, Maud, mm -hmm. and. Maud grabs and mm -hmm. like digs her nails yes. into Walter's shoulder. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Chris and Carol are like laughing. They're like they they don't believe it. Mm -hmm. um, and Maud just like Carol says, "I don't believe it. I just don't believe it. Yeah. Like I don't get what you're why you're trying to do this." Yeah. So we come to find out that Maud is stalling because yeah. Carol calls her out on it. You're stalling. That's yeah. what I don't believe. She tells her you're not fooling anyone. Yep. Mm -hmm. So Chris then you know. Promotes himself saying, well, it could be because you'd be a lot happier if Carol and I didn't stay here tonight. Right, right. Um, and Maud says, come on, Chris. Don't be ridiculous. There's an old Spanish mm -hmm. expression. Mi casa es su casa. And Walter's like, what does that what mean? What does that mean? <laughs> to which Maud says, how the hell do I know? Ask, Ask an, an old, old Spaniard. Spaniard. <laughs> Just the, the dialogue. They don't, they don't write comedies like they used to. Uh, no. So, you know, Carol calls her out. She says, yeah. you're not fooling anybody. Not fooling we, know, we know what you're doing. Yeah. So, you know, Chris then says, why don't I just drive up to Boston tonight and get an mm. early start? Right. So Walter says, good idea. If I wasn't yeah. so tired, I'd go with you. Yeah. <laughs> so, again, like, um, Carol Carol is, like, pleading with her mother. Like, mm -hmm. look, Chris and I won't see each other for four to six mm -hmm. weeks. We'd mm -hmm. really like to be alone. Mm -hmm. So really sort of driving home the idea that... Because Chris and Carol aren't going to see each other for so long, they want to, you know, they want to be intimate with each right. other. They want to, and not, sex does not equal, intimacy does not equal sex. Right. You don't have to have sex to be intimate with your partner. You can kiss, you can hold each other, you can be romantic with each other. That does not exclusively involve having one's genitals in one's mouth and or mm -hmm. other genitals. Mm-hmm. Although that Talk doesn't sex. hurt. Although... <laughs> Jackass. Thank you, Mom. I appreciate you. Oh, it that's what a mother's hurt. for. It doesn't hurt. I can't stand you. Couldn't hurt. But, I mean, yes, to your point, to your point, you don't have to have sex to be intimate with your partner. But it couldn't hurt. It couldn't hurt. It couldn't hurt. It couldn't hurt. So, um, at that point, Walter is just like, fine, you want to be alone, be alone, I don't care anymore, mm -hmm. like, just be alone, go go upstairs and go to bed. Right. So, Carol's now pleading, like, Mom, I love you, but you're driving me crazy. Right. Now, Carol says, we're going to go upstairs and get our things right, and right, leave. Right, And Maud is now, you know, she's being bitter, she's being petty, right. she's like, fine, all right, go, yeah. see if I can. Right. So now Maud and Walter are alone, and... and doesn't she tell, say, Walter, Walter, how could you do this to me? How could you do this to me? Yes. Like, and Walter's like, what What did I do? 
And Maud's like, I just threw my daughter out and you didn't raise a hand to stop me and you right, should have right, stopped me. Right. So Walter says it's easier to stop the Green Bay Packers. Right. To which True. Maud Maud says a low blow. Yes. She calls Walter average. average. Mm. As a as a as a genital, as a male genitalia having individual, I would feel awful if someone. Are we said sure it. about that? Oh, I thought so. <laughs> That's no, because the, no, I meant the reason. I meant you having the the genitalia. Oh, <laughs> we're unsure now. We don't know what's in my pants. Nobody knows. It could be doom for all I know. Um, I mean, you the, did untuck after the weekend, right? I did. <laughs> oh, thank goodness. I did, I did. I did. Okay. <laughs> but I mean, even... Uh, listen, me and Stella actually had a conversation... Me and Colin actually had a conversation about this where, like, Colin was like, I'm I'm tucked, I'm, like, wearing a gaff. Oh, my God. And I'm like, I'm just wearing tight underwear. But the thing is, I was also wearing palazzo pants and a and a blousey shirt. I know. Colin was wearing a, a, a tight leotard-type outfit where if... You don't have all the goodies completely hidden. No one knows what yeah. happened to you. Yeah. I can't I, so, I can't do all that. Do you know what oh my god almighty. My cousin's wife, I love her to absolute bits and pieces. Mm -hmm. The amount of time she has asked me, where does it go? Oh. Where does it go? I want to say Lord. to her, it went on vacation. <laughs> It went to Puerto Vallarta where all the uh, other gays are. Uh, That's where it went. It went, it went on va vacation with Vivian and Chuck. <laughs> <laughs> it went on vacation with Vivian and Chuck. So uh, uh, it's always interesting to have that conversation because, you know, and there are... Welcome to Talking with Tom, Cat. Talking with Tony with and Tom. Talking with Tony and Tom. <laughs> So, one of the oh. basics of drag is, you know, obviously, like, this is a show about Maud, but it's always nice to sort of have uh, these discussions these about drag. Sidebars. Sidebar discussions. Drag sidebar time. It's like fireside chats with presidents. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't, like, tuck tuck. You, it's painful. You know. It's painful because, you know, they're, they're, you'll obviously have your queens that will use duct tape. Yes. And yes. they'll, like, they'll, they'll. Pull everything yeah. back and they'll tuck it behind themselves. Yeah. No. No. I am far too hairy for that nonsense. Yeah, no. I am far no. too much of a Sasquatch. Yeah, no. So do you Well, use I don't I d I don't like tuck tuck. I I use specific I use I, special underwear. I, I have I have I have my tight underwear, I have tights, I have like and my And I mean, hip not pads. for nothing, how many and, have the hip pads, the tights. Yeah. You're tucked regardless. Yeah. And you know, honestly, I'm a I'm a grower, not a shower. So. I'm holding my face in shame. Y'all can't see this, but I am holding my face in shame. There's nothing wrong with being a grower, not a shower. Please, I don't, I don't want to think about my mother in that way. Thank you. I'd rather not. And you know, it's funny. We actually had a, we had a discussion the, the 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 week prior about our parents having sex. Oh God! But but Oof. honestly, like like when I'm when I'm in drag and everything, like anything in that region is is like the furthest furthest thought on my mind. Yeah, because you're thinking about are your eyelashes right? Are is your makeup on point? Is your makeup going to melt off of your face? Are my feet hurting? Are your feet hurting? Do I have like is like my corset like digging into me? I mean, that's the, that's sort of the irony of drag. Ooh, is I have a question. Yes. How, many, how many times has your has the boning come out of your corset? Once or and twice. You? Once or twice, not pleasant. Do you use steel bone or do you use plastic? Uh what I have is, I think it's probably plastic. I, oh, oh, I, I exclusively use steel bone corsets. Corsetstory.com, corsetstory.com has sales all the time. They have a five for one going on right at this moment. Well, I, well, I normally don't like, I use a corset corset. I've got one of those that it's like, a it hooks and then it zips oh, up. Oh, you use one of those. Yeah. I, you know. I'm a real drag queen. I use steel bone. I have, I do have steel, like when I did Miss Fire Island, I used the steel bone corset, but. For the most part, I, you know, especially too, I'm always singing. I, I can't be like, but let me tell you something. If you're, so the diaphragm is right above the belly button. Uh -huh. If you're cinched, there's a possibility that your vibrato will be that much stronger because you're cinched. It's hard for me to breathe. That, that all right, that I give you. It's hard for me to breathe. That I give you. You know, so, but, 
the the irony of drag is you know you're portraying this you know we're we, we we're portray- proje- we're portraying over exaggerated females yes and 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 in some ways very sexualized hypersexualized 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 but females the, the irony is that like you know for me I'm portraying this illusion yes but internally there is nothing like sexual about it for me whatsoever not in the slightest. Not in the slightest. You know, because... And I mean, we'll... At some point... The thing is with Maud, I don't think there's any episode that involves drag. Not at all. But, you know, it's important to have these sort of conversations as queer... As queer entertainers and the... In the queer field of drag. um, Because drag is inherently queer. Yeah. Like, it's inherently... Like, you're you're portraying something that you are not. Right. Or you are portraying something that you are and it's just over-exaggerated. Um, but when it comes to specifying what is and what isn't drag, cross-dressing, I don't find to be drag. No. And I know that there are some drag queens out there that are like, it's cross-dresser a clock, or I'm a cross-dresser. And, you know, there's always, there, there always needs to sort of be that distinction between what is drag and what is cross-dressing. Mm. Cross-dressing, the same thing as being a, um, a transvestite, is where you will get dressed up in women's clothing and right. you will engage in sexual intercourse right. with other people. Or you will get your sexual kicks by putting on, True. Some by peop- putting on female for clothing. For some people it, it is like a fetish thing. For some people it is a fetish, for to, some people it is a turn up on for in, them. Yes. Yeah, in, in uh, you know, women's Correct. clothing. You know, and it was uh, it was the same thing when I started doing cosplay. As a matter of fact, because mm-hmm. there were some people that would come up to me and be like, "Do you like? Do you like get turned on by this?" And I'm like, "Do I look like I get turned on in this nonsense? Yeah. I am wearing so much foam rubber mm-hmm. and whalebone right. and horse hair. Right. I don't know if I'm, a, you know, a drag queen or a five piece room group right. at Levitt's Warehouse. Yes. But now speaking of cosplay, now aren't there the, that isn't there that subgroup like? The, the fuzzies? Is that, is that, are those the ones that they get off sort of on dressing up as like I want fuzzy, a, okay. like plush okay. animals? And, All right. Since, since we're having this discussion. it's a sexual thing, right? It's hysterical. It is absolutely hilarious that you use the term fuzzies. If that's not the right term? It's not the right oh, term. Okay. But the reason why that's funny to me is because that's what my cousin's wife calls them. Oh, they are called it's furries. Furries. I know it's something like furries. It's something like that. And yes, that is a that is a fetish. That is a sexual subculture to not only to um, cosplay, but also to the BDSM scene. Okay. Because it sort of relays heavily into the puppy play. Okay. Aspect of a right. gay subculture. Right. Um. And yes, there are people that engage in sexual intercourse in these like sort of mascot mm-hmm. outfits and. No. There was a friend of mine that worked for Disney. She actually said, would you ever consider auditioning to be a, uh, not a face character, but Uh as a character performer for Disney where you would put on, and I'm like, no. I would get so claustrophobic. And it is hot in those. It is hot in Florida. Yeah. It is very hot in Florida, and it is hot in those mascot costumes. Oh, God, yeah. Um, But yes, they are called furries. They are called fuzzies. Fuzzies, furries. Um, but yeah, it's not it's not exclusively a cosplay thing. But yes, at conventions you will see at conventions you will see all walks of life. Oh, I'm sure you will see drag queens. You will mm-hmm. see, uh, you know, you'll see female impersonators. You will see costumed entertainers. You will see Disney princesses. You will mm-hmm. see Disney princes. You will see mm-hmm. any single type of animal is at a convention. Mm-hmm. Um, as long as there's as long as it's about as long as there are consenting adults. Mm-hmm. You can pretty much get away with just about anything if you go to a convention. True. Within the realm of reality. True. Like, there's obviously people that should not bring their sexual fetishes to... Like, you're not going to see people with leashes. You're not mm-hmm. going to see people... Like, you'll see people in leather and latex, but it's like a Catwoman costume mm-hmm. or or something of equal or better value. Okay. Um, like, there's really nothing hyper-fetishized about going to a convention unless you're going to, like, Exotica or Otica or, or, like, the Folsom... Or Folsom Street, yeah. where you'll see like BDSM on full display. Sometimes there are like it's not even that it's just that there are no costumes. There are sometimes there are like no clothes. There are no clothes. Period. The end. At all. Um, I don't know how they get away with that. Like right in public. I mean, because it's Folsom Street. Yeah, it's Folsom Street, and you know, witty repartee, uh, who is a very a very famous uh, drag empress, um, who no longer is part of the Imperial Corp, but she actually. Uh, is a member of the mm. board for Folsom Street. Mm. So she's constantly looking for entertainers. She's constantly looking for performers. Yeah. Um, and it's about, you know, it's about sexual liberation. It's about right. being okay with being into sort of the fetish scene and sort mm-hmm. of into the BDSM world. Mm-hmm. Um, I personally like it because I like leather. 
mm-hmm. but I don't engage in leather play. Right. I, you know, I, I enjoy wearing leather. I like the leather jackets. I, mm-hmm. like if I if it. <laughs> God will get me for this. God will get you for this. If I was to be a 20-something in the 80s mm-hmm. or in the 70s, mm-hmm. I would have adored mm-hmm. Tom of Finland. Oh, I love Tom of I, I love Tom of Finland, but mm-hmm. I also love the, mm-hmm. you know, the leather pants and mm-hmm. the leather jackets. I don't have that body type, although mm. I would like to. Yes, yeah, same. Um, but it's just, it's sort of interesting how all of these, because it's dress up. At the end yeah. of the day, it's dress up. Yes. It's well, just, you know, I've always felt like that. That whole like le- leather scene, it's it's really it's just like another form of drag. Mm-hmm. You're just you're just you know instead of I mean you, you look at the bar scene. Yeah, look at going into bars, you'll have like your Mr. Yeah. Leathers, yeah. you'll have your Miss Fire Island, yeah. you'll have yeah. your, like they all they're all sort of intercommingled in yeah. some way, and it's all about creativity and performance yeah, art. It's sort of creating you know you create you're creating an illusion. It's all performance yeah. art. Yes. We're all an illusion. Yes. But getting back to my... Slightly used second hand. <laughs> my point from the beginning is that I just never... For me, getting in all my, my drag and everything... It's not sexual at all. Nothing. It's not sexual nothing sexual whatsoever. There was a, not Not to, again, not to not completely derail from the conversation, which, you know... I mean, not to derail from the episode, but there was actually a friend of mine who called me out. Uh-huh. Um, because when I... Uh, Here's my thing. It is not sexual for me to get into these costumes. Uh-huh. It's not sexual for me to get dressed up as these certain characters, despite right. the fact that some of the characters that I dress up as are inherently sexy. Right, right. Um, there are times when I will, like, turn to a specific gender of person. Like, uh-huh. And, you know, one of the things that I enjoy so much is that I enjoy when people look at me in a sexual way. I enjoy, sure. I enjoy being sexually objectified when I am dressed as these characters. Yes, because yes. it's like, hi, I, I, I'm I, not what you think I am. Right, right. But he called me out on it because he was just like, you know, you say it's not an inherently sexual thing, but here you are trying to be. It's, it's very psychologically and sociologically interesting to me. Yes. I should write a paper on it. Yes. I should write a dissertation. No, but on I, it. Th- that's exactly how I feel. Mm-hmm. I'm I'm preve- I'm presenting a very highly sexualized, sexualized type character, mm-hmm. but for me, it's not it's it's not a she- it's not a sexual thing. Yeah. So, yeah. It's a sexual thing for other people. For them, yes. For other other people. But not, not for me. Not for me. Not for me. Uh, I'm like, honey, I can't wait to... Like, I, always, I always tell people... Get home, undo the girdle, take the shoes off. And I'm like... When, uh, when I... You know, when I have conversations with... Uh, when I had conversations with uh, gentlemen callers, they would always ask, like, oh, do you dress? Do you dress? And I'm like, no one's... No, oh, whoop, almost slept on that one. No one is having sex with my art. Mm-hmm. But I would say it in a much more vulgar way. Uh-huh. I'd say no one is effing my right. my art. Right. Um, and they'd be like, "Oh come on!" But it's so much uh, fun. I'm like, "It's fun for you. It's not yeah, fun to get you. all dressed up in that." No. Not and then be all me. sweaty. Ew. 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 Oh, no. No. The answer, no. The answer is no. The answer is no. negative. Yeah. No. So now that you know, now that we've certifiably derailed from the conversation. Oh my lord! Where, 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 where are we? Where were we in? Oh, uh, Maud was. She was. You know, be, uh, uh, bemoaning the fact that she uh, is a hypocrite. Yes. You know. Um, so Maud and Walter are now like having it out, like where you know Walter's like, well, what 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 about the conversation you just had with Arthur? Mm-hmm. Like, you know, you want to be this modern liberated woman, mm-hmm. and that's what you told Arthur. Like, right. what what happened? Yeah. Um, and he points out he's trying to say that you know she wasn't bothered by the fact that they went camping and she knew what was going to be happening. Yep. Yeah. And she says, you don't know how, you know, uh, something, she had to bite her tongue. Yeah. When, I talk one way when, and I act another. Yeah. If I want a parrot, I'll buy and one. And <laughs> she's like revealing that, you know, in her heart, she's she's really a square. Yup. When Carol told me she was thinking of running off with Chris for four days in a camper, I put a tooth mark in my tongue that'll take mm. ten years to heal. Right. Uh, she calls herself a square and she says, I may not always practice it yeah. because obviously she's been divorced four times. Yes. So she's obviously been on dates and she's obviously been intimate with... Well, it's, it's you see, Maud is what they call a serial monogamist. Yeah. She's like, you know, it's like, she, she, she doesn't have any problem with there being multiple partners, but it has to be, it has to be one at a time. Yep. 
you know, and she's got to like, you know, they've got they've got to be married. But I believe in the old fashioned things right. and the ring and the vows right. and right. the license and right. the ceremony and the right. wedding bed and in that order. Right. She right. says, "I Maud Findlay." In my heart, I'm Arthur Harmon. In their heart, promise the you won't tell the neighbors. Yes, <laughs> that was that was true, very true. And you know, Walter is comforting his wife. Like, there's yeah. what are you what are you ashamed of? There's yeah. got to be millions of mothers facing the same right. problem. Yes, who feel yes. the same way. Right. And you know, Maud is having that sort of inner conflict where it's like it's so old fashioned. I have, I have two feet in my generation. Right. I want to have at least one in, in Carol's. Carol's. That's right. You know. She wants to be a modern she mother. She wants to be a modern mother. And it's, you know, for a woman of Maud's age and for the time period in which Maud took place, mm-hmm. it's very challenging. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, you want to sort of have these old-fashioned ideals where you want to have your child fall in love and be romantic and mm-hmm. then get married and then have sex. Right. Whereas right. nowadays, everyone's having sex before marriage. Yeah, please. Well, most most parents today, I think, would encourage their 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 kids to live together before they get married. Yes. That's the that is the in thing now where you yeah. where you live together before marriage because you don't know. Yeah. You don't know how your partner lives. Right. Like you don't know how you like you can be in your partner's house, yes. but you do not know how your partner lives. Right. Like when they're alone and when they're not doing anything. Are they like cleaning the house? Are they taking care of themselves? Are they bathing enough? Mm-hmm. Like these are the these are the types of things that you want yeah. to figure out if you can live with or not. Right. Yeah. Because being able to live with somebody doesn't mean you're able to marry them. Right. Or live with or like deal with them in that way. Yeah. You know. I remember once reading that someone was with their partner and their partner always used to stir the tea too loudly. <laughs> <laughs> or, or they wouldn't squeeze all of the. T- they would. They would squeeze all the toothpaste out of the tube, and they would squeeze from the middle. And I'm like, okay, sometimes you just need to. Oh lord. Sometimes you just need to let bygones be bygones and deal with it. That makes me think of uh, the episode of the Odd Couple, where um, uh, uh, what's you call it? Like, um, Oscar was having to take care of Felix or so- or something. Yeah. And, and uh, like he he made him his orange juice, <laughs> and he got the pits. From the fresh squeezed oranges. Oh no! In the in the juice. In the and, juice. And Felix was like, "I don't like pits, pits, pits in my juice." Well, what happened was, Oscar was sleepwalking. Yes. Because he like he was, he was trying to be nice to Felix. Yeah. But in trying to be nice to Felix, it was like it was making him hate Felix even more. Oh. So he would start sleepwalking at night, and he would like take like something, and he, he would hit Felix. He would hit Felix with it. And in, in his in his in his sleep, and that was one of the things like Arthur was uh, Oscar was dreaming, and he's hearing Felix going, "I don't like pits, pits, pits in my juice, juice, juice." <laughs> Another very funny show. We'll do that next. <laughs> <laughs> Another very funny show. Oh. So at that point, Carol I, and Chris come downstairs with all their gear. With all their gear they're gonna they're gonna leave. So you know. They, well, actually, I don't think they were gonna leave. They were just gonna stay outside in the camper, right? Oh, I had no idea. They were maybe they were gonna stay in the camper and then they were gonna just do that. Yeah. I guess it wasn't. It wasn't clearly. It wasn't clearly stated. But yeah. Carol's like, "We're leaving." Yeah. And Maud's like, "No, I've thought it all Don't over. Leave and you're staying this way. here, and that's that." And uh, Chris is, uh, and, and Carol and Chris. Carol's like, "Chris, will you please get my mother out of the way?" Yeah. And you see, he, he takes a step towards Maud, and she growls. She's growling at him. Yeah. Yeah. So Chris is like, "It's been a long evening. Please mm-hmm. don't make me. Please don't make me beat up mm-hmm. your mother." Mm-hmm. I actually said, "Please don't make me move your mother," mm-hmm. because you know, EPS, yeah, Elder Protective Services. You don't want to beat up an old woman. No, no. an older woman, uh, an older woman. Yeah, I don't think uh, I don't think Chris would have had a chance against not a, not in the anyway. slightest, not at all. Uh. So you know, Maud is like Maud. Maud is trying to do that balancing act where it's yes. like, look, I refuse. To be upset about the two of you staying here in my own house. Mm-hmm. I mean, Lord only knows what went on in that camper. Strike, Strike that. that! Yeah. Because she obviously, you know, doesn't, doesn't she doesn't she doesn't want to think about her child she's having that way. sex. Hey, of course um, not. No parent. No parent. No does. parent wants to think about their child having sex. No. 
So, you know, Chris then is like confronting her. Like, you do realize what you're asking. You want Carol and me to stay upstairs to prove yeah. that you're a modern, modern mother. mother. Right. So everyone is finally starting to call Maud out on her BS. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Maud's like, look, after all the trouble you brought into this house, you owe me a favor. Mm -hmm. So, you know, at that point, Carol's like, do you honestly think that we can stay in this house after all of this? Right. So Maud turns to Walter and says, you're right. Walter, get your toothbrush, we're leaving. Right. So, you know, Maud is like, come on, we can stay in the camper. You always said you wanted to get closer get to closer nature. closer to nature, right. And Walter says probably one of the stupidest lines in the episode. Yeah. There could be a, I don't want to stay out there tonight, Maud. There could be a big, big black, black dog, dog out, out there. there. Yeah, I didn't get that. Were there many strays around during the 70s? I don't no. know. No. I don't know. So um, Carol, Ma Carol takes Maud into the kitchen right. saying, like, let's, let's talk this out. Right, right. Um... So, and, you know, Maud's like, who talks first? Right. Let's so, let's have so, this out. So uh, Carol, I think she she broaches it. And she she says to Maud, like, D don't you realize why I never I never wanted you to ask Chris to stay in the first place? Yes. And um, because Carol felt weird about you know being with her boyfriend in the same house yep. with her mother. Yep. So it finally so, comes out that Carol felt just, just as, as awkward as Maud, as Maud did. did. Right. So she's like, do you realize what you just said? Not under my not under my own mother's roof. Right, right. So Carol's like, of course I realize what I just said. I said it, didn't I? Yeah, You're not the only yeah. one who's old-fashioned. Right. You didn't have to feel guilty. Right. And Maud says, if I want to feel guilty, I'll feel guilty. It cleanses my soul. <laughs> Some people take laxatives. I take guilt. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it comes out that Carol is just a chip off the old block. Yep. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Maud then says... Maud tells her own story. Like, remember last year when Walter was over? My mother's house? Yeah, her, her and Walter went... went they stayed at her mother's house. They stayed at her mother's house. They stayed at her mother's she house. She was right across the hall, too. Do you know, I wouldn't even let Walter kiss, kiss me. Her. Right. And, you know, treated, Maud treated him like just someone who climbed in through the window. Mm-hmm. So, at that point, Carol and Maud, like, start to exchange pleasantries. Mm -hmm. Like, Carol's getting ready to leave. Right. Um, and Carol again says, we won't see each other for four weeks. We'd really like to be, be alone. alone. So, Maud's like, scouts on her. Mm-hmm. Carol puts up three fingers. She does the, the thing salute. And Maud says, I've actually said this to kids. Mm -hmm. I've said this to my kids. Because, you know, in the cosplay community, I'm right. not con mom. Like, okay. I'm, I'm the mother of all of them. Okay. And I say, you know, I hope, and for her sake, I hope, wow, I completely and totally cut that line out. Why did I do oh. that? So Maud turns to Carol and says, if you ever have a daughter, I hope she turns out like you. Right. And for her sake, I hope her mother, mother turns, turns out, out like, like me. me. Yes. So they exit. It's uh, well, she spanks Carol's behind. Yes. And sends Carol on her way. Yes. And Which is okay. She's her mother. Yes, very much so. So it wasn't like you know. It's not like you know. It's not like an employer. Not like an employer, not like sexual harassment. It's it's That's, your mother. It's your mother. She's allowed. She's she's changed. She's changed her diapers. She's changed her dieties. She's allowed. She's allowed to do that. So the epilogue comes. Well, the episode ends, and now we're to the epilogue. To the epilogue. Chris and Chris and Carol like burst through the door. Yes. Which. In white, in upstate, not not upstate, in Tuckahoe, Tuckahoe. New York, yes. would you honestly leave your door unlocked? Hell no. Not in the well, slightest. Unless I knew. I'm sure Carol had a key. Probably. I'm sure Carol had a key. That's true. That's a fair statement. So probably, you know, she used the key to So open Carol the door. and Chris burst forth. But they just saying, burst in. As like, mother, mother, like calling everyone down, yes. waking everybody up. Uh, Maud and Walter come downstairs, and like Maud is bereft. Like th th you woke us up at four in the morning. Mm -hmm. This had better be good. Mm -hmm. And we come to find out that Chris proposed to Carol. Mm -hmm. They're so engaged. They're engaged. Mm -hmm. So Maud, Maud and Walter are overjoyed. Mm -hmm. They're like exclaiming, "Oh, congratulations, mm -hmm. congratulations!" Maud again grabs Chris's face and squeezes. Mm -hmm. That baby um, face. So. Uh, Chris is like, well, then you don't mind if I stay over. Right. And Maud's like, mind? Are you kidding? I wouldn't have it any other way. Come on, Carol. Let's, let's fix, fix the guest the best room. room. Uh, so, you know, old habits die hard. Yes. He's not letting that go. And with that. Oh, my Lord. That ends. 
<laughs> we went through a lot in this episode. There was a lot to unpack in this episode. My goodness. <laughs> we added a lot. And there was a lot that was added. We added course. a lot. But of that's course. to your benefit. That's to your benefit. Just think. We're saying these things to you to educate you and to entertain you at the same time. Um, but yes, we thank you for watching another marvelous episode of God Will Get You For That, Walter. Mm -hmm. If you would like, you can follow us, you can follow this podcast all over where podcasts can be found. Buzzsprout, iHeartRadio, Pandora, Spotify, you name it, we're there. Amazon, Apple, Facebook Podcasts. Yup. All of it. Um, if you would like to follow us on Instagram, you can at Finley's Friendly Appliances. Mm -hmm. On YouTube, we are God Will Get You For That Walter. Mm -hmm. On Facebook, we are God Will Get You For That Walter. Mm -hmm. And as mentioned earlier in this episode, if you would like to email us, you can at Finley's Friendly Appliances at gmail.com. Mm -hmm. If you would like to follow me, you can at that Tomcat on all forms of social media, and that's cat with two T's. Yep. And if they would like to follow you, it's Tony Homeperm. Tony with an I! Tony, Tony with an I! And that's it. And that's it. We thank you for listening. And you'll <laughs> listen to us again on another episode of God Will Get You For That, Walter. Night, guys. Bye-bye.